calling now. Could I have a level, please? Sure. I'm an old buddy of John Cox. I've known John a long time. We were students at Duke University together, and in fact, we were lab partners. And John Cox tells a lot of stories about that, but that's because he's trying to excuse the fact that I made a better grade than he did. <laughs> and I'll tell you in the interview why it was he thinks I made a better grade than he did. Well, I first knew John Cock when I walked into a laboratory class in undergraduate physics at Duke University during World War II. We were both uh, apprentice seamen in the United States Navy, very unlikely sailors. And we were in a physics laboratory together. We took other courses together, too. And uh, John, in fact, uh, remembers that better than I do because he's told more than one person at IBM that the reason that I made a better grade than he did in the lab course is because my girlfriend typed up my lab reports and nobody typed up his, which were largely illegible, even though the physics was okay. John's an extraordinary, extraordinary human being. John's the only person, I, well, one of the very few people I know whose IQ is higher than his blood cholesterol level. John is a unique human being. I think he is the most creative person in the IBM company. In fact, he comes very close to being the most creative person I ever knew. He may be the smartest person, but I don't know. I've known some awful smart people, and there's some very smart folks in IBM that might be able to compete with him on, in brain puzzles. Uh, but uh, John's uh, creativity comes from way down deep inside somewhere. And I think it's based on the fact that he is just infinitely curious and doesn't feel any self-imposed limitations on what it's appropriate to be curious about. So he moved from one topic to another uh, without a hitch. He worked in, he did engineering, he did experimental physics ideas, he did mathematics, he did software, he did systems architecture, and more importantly, he put them all together. And of course, many people will have told you that he walks down the hall visiting people's rooms. He will start a conversation with you and walk out the door, and he expects you to follow along. And if you don't, he'll follow you along uh, and keep the conversation going. Absolutely wonderful human being who has uh, carried a lot of the rest of the IBM with him, but done it so modestly and so wonderfully. Did you get phone calls from Intuitive? No, I didn't get phone calls from. It started as a separate section without me in it. Oh. Without the end. Uh, John had a reputation for calling people up in the middle of the night and talking to them at odd times. He didn't do that to me, maybe because uh, of the, the courtesy, because I was over in Armonk uh, and not in the research laboratory. I was chief scientist at, during my years at IBM. But uh, uh, John was certainly uh, not hesitant. Uh, to share his ideas with whoever would listen. Uh, and of course I learned, I knew from having known him as an undergraduate that uh, he was very, very worth listening to. Not everything that he came up with was fabulous. Uh, but so much more was fabulous than the company he took advantage of that, uh, that uh, he made a huge contribution. Uh, I know that he did a lot of things in the area of algorithms and software and compilers. Uh, I think probably his most notable contribution all in all uh, is the RISC architecture uh, because that was the first time anybody had ever conceived of a computer as a hardware and software system uh, developed uh, in the same concept uh, to be optimized together. And that's, an extra, that's a very powerful principle. It took the industry a long time to get around to it. And it's not to IBM's credit that they let his idea languish as long as they did uh, before uh, finally being successful with it. But uh, what fascinated me about John is when he invented the tail dragger uh, disc head uh, in order to fly a disc without crashing at ever smaller dimensions above the surface. Uh, and uh, his invention of a super low inertial slider for, for uh, disk technology. Because there was no particular reason why he should even have been thinking about disk technology. 
uh, considering what he was doing. Did you find, <clears throat> when you came to IBM in 1972, did you find a lot of difference in John that you'd known as a lab partner? Or did you see what he'd become in the person that you'd known? Again, After uh, I had known John so at... Uh, after I had known John at Duke, of course, in World War II, we both graduated and went our separate ways. Uh, I lost track of him. I didn't know where he had gone. And it came as a very pleasant surprise when I discovered he was at IBM when I arrived in 1972. Yeah, he was very much the same John Cock I had always known. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, a little rumpled and a little scruffy from time to time. Uh, he didn't worry too much about personal appearance and those things, it didn't really matter that much. Uh, since then, uh, after having achieved the august uh, position of IBM's leading fellow, uh, he's become a little more conservative. But uh, uh, he was always uh, just a wonderful, genuine human being. I've known very few people who are basically as modest as John. Uh, and it's very hard to be that smart and that modest. Uh, I don't think I or several other very smart IBMers I could name uh, can qualify for that particular praise. Uh, John's also stubborn about his intellectual ideas. He, uh, if he had a strongly held view, he didn't let go of it easily. That's a very important property, and in fact, his success at IBM is in part because of that because there's a million and one reasons why any truly original idea is very hard to get into the business. I remember during a number of years when we were trying to get uh, IBM going in the supercomputer business and uh, the Kingston Laboratory took on that mission, uh, worked very hard at it. The people there were very conscientious in trying to uh, get IBM to be a good Cray competitor. Uh, John felt very deeply and very strongly that they were on the wrong track architecturally. Uh, and he had very good reasons for believing it. He was not able to convince very many people. And uh, that, to me, uh, didn't mean very much, uh, but we certainly tried to give him every chance to, uh, to win that argument. It didn't worry me too much if he didn't win it, uh, because ideas have to fit the capabilities of the institution to carry them out and sometimes they don't fit very well. But uh, uh, John is, uh, is worth his weight in gold. It's hard to figure out why John uh, uh, is so successful in his, in his creativity. And I think it's basically because uh, he is just deeply, genuinely interested and fascinated in what goes on. He has a kind of delight uh, in the technical subjects he's, he's working on that is contagious, and that catches other people. But he's not frivolous about it. He's deadly serious about his work, but he enjoys it. And that, that joy is, is contagious. Now, in that respect, he's not unique. Uh, almost all uh, really able scientists uh, have that quality. But John also, it's hard to be both stubborn and sharing. Uh, and yet he is both stubborn and sharing because uh, if you look at his, at the documented uh, uh, track record, John Denver wrote papers. Uh, he very rarely patented anything. Uh, he just made the ideas flow in his own mind and in other people's minds, and, and other people ran off and, and as he indeed hoped they would, uh, to exploit these ideas. So uh, people like that uh, are rare, uh, who don't, uh, he, he has no lack of self-confidence that would cause him to want to squirrel uh, his ideas to himself and to worry about whether he got all the proper credit or not. Uh, and that, that sharing combined with tenacity, let's call it that instead of stubbornness, uh, is really an important attribute. When you were chief scientist, did you get a chance to work with him? Yeah. Because you were in Armagh and he was at Yorktown. There was quite a division. Were there opportunities for you to get together? Again, in the show yeah. yourself? The, the, uh, as chief scientist, I saw a lot of John Cock. Uh, I never uh, expected him 
uh, to sort of come to Armont for a tour of duty. Uh, that really wouldn't have fit uh, his talent. Uh, but uh, he participated in a large number of our science advisory committee meetings, and he was, of course, a central figure in many, many of the particular topics that the Corporate Technical Committee looked into. So that uh, uh, when uh, we had these meetings, he was always there, there participating. But, uh, of course, I count John a close personal friend, too, and have always enjoyed uh, that association. John, by the way, is appreciated outside IBM more than most people appreciate and more than most people know. Uh, I'm a director of a company that's not in the computer business at all. Uh, and the chief executive officer of that, that business would do anything to, to persuade John when he retires to just take up an office in his company's research lab and just be there <laughs> and, and talk to people uh, and inspire them. Uh, John cares a lot about uh, institutions. He cares a lot about IBM. He's been very generous to Duke University and done a lot to help the engineering school there uh, improve its quality. Uh, so he's given a lot back uh, to the institutions that he, that he gained from. If, if he's not, then we'll drop the question. Yeah. I suspect John works better in a team than most people would have thought. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to see the internals of how the Rios group down in Austin actually operated. I saw the results of it when I went down there for visits. But uh, my guess is that John works fine in a team of colleagues if they are reasonably well matched to him uh, intellectually, as indeed that, that group was. The leaders of that group was a very good group. And I really give IBM a lot of credit for being willing to set up an expensive product program and put it in the hands of uh, John Cock and Andy Heller and Frank King uh, and others. That uh, runs against the conventional wisdom of, of that we normally associate with how IBM does, uh, does product activities. But uh, uh, I think the results of that extraordinarily successful venture it's the only time in the 15 years I was at IBM when the company got its brightest people and said to them, build us the best product that you can, that you think is the best product you can do, uh, and didn't force it into a lot of compromises, at least not until it was very far down the path. And the result really shows, and I hope very much that the IBM management has learned a lesson from that, uh, because if the whole company had products that were as outstanding as that one is, uh, my goodness, what a successful, how good my retirement would be. <laughs> when I came to IBM in 1972, it was uh, a, a down period for IBM. In fact, the year 1972 was the first time that IBM earnings had, had not continued on its every year growth path. And there were articles in Fortune magazine wondering about whether the company had gotten too big and reached a, a saturation point. Uh, at that time, it was hard to see the enthusiasm uh, that characterized the 360 program uh, and earlier the stretch program that fed so much technology into the 360. In fact, one of the things that startled me when I first came to IBM was to discover that the research division in IBM seemed to do research on everything except computers. And I thought that was odd. Uh, now, in point of fact, it's not quite fair because there had been a computer architecture project uh, uh, called, uh, I think it was called System A, uh, which had just recently been transferred from Yorktown into a product organization and the people went with it. So I came there just at the moment between between projects. But in those days, the, the view was that it was hard to do computer research, per se, because the, what's the criterion for value in computer science? A computer is a human ar artifact. Its value depends on how people use it. So unless you have a mathematical model of people, uh, how can you build a criterion for excellence in, in computer design and computer architecture? It took a long time to get past that point. Uh, where it was really possible for excellent scientists uh, to use their full capabilities 
to try to see how computer architectures could be improved. And that happened over the years, but uh, it, that, the computer industry was still in a fairly primitive stage uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. I don't, uh, I tell you, I don't know where the stretch had any significance as architecture. It obviously did as hardware. Uh, but I'm not that familiar with what, what the design was. Okay. And, cl and clearly 360 was enormously important as architecture. Well, possibly we could put something there. Because what I'm seeing, I'm seeing some trends in the interviews. Mm -hmm. And the stretch has some comments on it, but they're from the people who worked on it. I would love to get just some statement of how it flowed into the 360 and therefore was important. Well, you better get that, though. You better get that from Fred Brooks and people who okay. were deeply involved in it. Okay. Can you introduce the byte, I think? Stretch. Yeah, they named the byte. Yeah. I, I, that's, a, I mean, that's a big question. Uh, there, there have been a lot of times in IBM's history when uh, there was a major architecture effort that failed, and the technology that was designed to go with it succeeded. Uh, but sometimes those failures were anticipating the future uh, prematurely. That's, for example, true in the, uh, the uh, famous uh, uh, project that started in 1972, uh, which uh, failed because there is no way that uh, the system design, uh, the customers could migrate to it. It didn't have channels. Uh, the data structures were all different. Uh, on the other hand, that whole project lived in System 38, and the company for years tried to kill System 38, and the customers just insisted on buying it. Uh, and, and that became the basis, really, for the success of the 400 AS 400 system. I think it'd be going back to the days when we were lab partners. Uh, I think it wouldn't be fair to try to characterize uh, any differences between me and John on how we approached uh, things like that. Uh, sure, J John was the same John Cock then that he was later. Uh, bright and iconoclastic. Uh, and uh, probably not quite as accustomed to doing things the way you were supposed to do them uh, as I was. Uh, I was a little more adaptable. But uh, as far as the physics was concerned, uh, we both had a lot of fun with the physics. And I don't, I don't think there's any big difference uh, there. Uh, uh, I guess the fact that my girlfriend typed up the lab reports was gilding the lily on my part. <laughs> it was certainly not necessary. Uh, uh, I don't really know that it had much to do with the grade either, <laughs> as far as that goes. There, uh, uh, there was one uh, episode that I remember, uh, uh, if I remember it correctly, it's been a long time. John and one or two other of the physics students, there were only a handful of physics majors because the war was going on and, and we were in a V12S program that allowed us to stay and finish. And several of the physicists, I was not one of them, decided they wanted to take a, uh, an advanced undergraduate course in uh, inorganic chemistry, in the chemistry department for which the prerequisites were a year of freshman chemistry, a year of analytical chemistry, and a year of quantitative chemistry. And uh, this was the senior course. And these folks had never had any course in chemistry. Chairman of the chemistry department refused until the chairman of the physics department said, look, these are very unusually bright students. Why don't you let them try? And the chemistry professor was sure they would fail. Anyway, they, they took this course in physical chemistry. And when it was all over, the three physics students made 199 and 98, and the highest chemist on the same scale was in the 60s. Uh, it was a real wipeout. I've already indicated that I think his major contribution was his extraordinary facility 
for moving back and forth between uh, software issues, architectural issues, systems issues, and the physical uh, embodiment uh, of them, and indeed all kinds of inventions uh, on the hardware side, but done with the understanding of, this, of the context. So much of IBM's very good hardware work has suffered from people who didn't understand properly the context. And I think that's more than just being a double threat person. Uh, I think it's understanding fundamentally that these are two dimensions of the same piece of technology. And to me, that is what uh, uh, is most powerful about his, uh, his contributions. Every time he invented uh, something like the low inertia slider, uh, he had in mind how the data would be organized and how the software might take advantage of that technology. There have been so many technologies in IBM that never did much for the customer because nobody ever changed the architecture and the software uh, to, to optimize their value. Uh, and indeed, there have been contrary examples where very good hardware failed because it didn't have decent software. Uh, and I think that's uh, uh, a lesson which John helped teach, and I hope it's been widely learned.